Governor Scott Walker, thank you so much for joining me, sir. Thanks, Liz. Glad to be on with you. All right. So let me ask you the million dollar question to start our interview today. Um, are you the first of the 2024 Republican hopefuls that I'm going to interview this year? <laughs> well, I'm a quarter century younger than Joe Biden, so I got plenty of time. <laughs> now, my, my commitment for at least the next four or five years is to get things turned around with young people, which is why I'm at YAF. All right. Well, you know, I have to say I expected you to pivot away from the question, but that was a good witty pivot. So I'll give you a point for that. <laughs> Let me ask you, if you were to decide to run in 2024, what would be some of the conditions that would trigger you to decide, yes, it's my call to answer or no, I'm going to leave that for somebody else? Well, I think in the future, we got to look at who's not only the right leader to take on Joe Biden, but who's the right leader to move this country forward. Uh, you know. Donald Trump did phenomenal things over the past four years. And I think not only Republicans and conservatives, but Americans uh, want to have a leader who's going to take us in the right direction. So I think it boils down to not just who can win, but who can lead. And that should be the determination of anyone who's thinking about running, not just can they win, uh, but can they lead. About a year and a half before I ran for governor, that's what I did. I went around and visited with some governors I thought were doing a good job to see not only how I might win, but rather how I might govern, which is part of the reason why we literally took action the first day we were in office, which you can't you can't waste a day, particularly in our nation's capital or the swamp will eat you up. Right. It's interesting, isn't it, in these days, how running for higher office, whether it's a governor, whether even in the Senate, certainly the presidency, it's actually two skill sets. It's campaigning and winning the election. And then it's also governing and leading. And it didn't used to be like that. I think it, it draws a lot of people who like the campaigning side who aren't qualified to be leaders. So that's a really good point. Um, speaking of President Trump, he spoke to this very issue on Lisa Booth's podcast early this week. He named a list of Republican politicians who he thought are the future of the Republican Party. Among those were Ron DeSantis, uh, Christy Noem, Sarah Huckabee Sanders. He named quite a few people. Josh Hawley, your name was not on that list, Governor Walker. Why do you think that is? I think because he knows, as do many others around him, that I'm focused on being here at Young America's Foundation. We got to turn things around. Look, I come from Wisconsin, a battleground state. Uh, conservatives in the future aren't going to carry Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Georgia, unless we can get this new generation on the right path. And so uh, folks in his team and other teams, other conservative Republican leaders around the country know that's where our focus is. I know we've got to have a long game approach. Uh, not just uh, the battle of the day, but really match what the left has been doing since the 1960s. And that is laying the groundwork for the control they have, not just on campuses, but in culture uh, and even in many ways in our communications when it comes to the censorship from big tech. And I want to talk to you about a couple of those things, particularly the long game. This is your new initiative at YAF. It's really exciting, and I want people to understand exactly what it is. But before I ask you about that initiative, I want to zero in on a phrase that you use. This is one of my pet issues, the culture wars. Mm -hmm. I feel like there are so many conservatives uh, and Republicans, perhaps Republicans, I should say, uh, who are unwilling to fight the culture wars or who cave to corporate interests. And in the interest of not being vague here, I'm talking about Governor Kristi Noem. We see up in her state in South Dakota how she has a bill before her given to her by the legislature that would bar biological males from competing in women's sports. That would be males who have transitioned to females. And she's caving. She won't sign this bill. She's caving to corporate interests like Amazon and the Chamber of Commerce and the NCAA. How do you respond to that? What is she doing incorrectly? Well, I hope in this case she comes back and whatever modification she said she wants doesn't take away from the core of the bill, which is women, young women in particular, in high school sports specifically, in that state and any other state, shouldn't have to compete against someone who was born biologically a man. It's just not fair. For all the talk, remember last week, when understandably there was a lot of attention drawn to the fact that the NCAA tournament had different weight rooms for the men and women when it came to basketball. Uh, that certainly, I, I think, was a legitimate gripe. But it's far worse when you think about allowing this to happen unchecked, uh, where women's sports are taken over by people who are born biologically as men. So Governor Nome should sign a bill that prohibits that, as should governors all across the country. 
And this this type of bill, by the way, is on the desks of governors across the country, or at least in the legislatures in states across the country. So the modifications that you refer to, one of the modifications that Governor Nome is calling for is actually the enforcement mechanism of the bill she wants to remove. She wants to remove the ability of girls to litigate uh, if schools allow biological males to compete in women's sports, therefore hurting the girls, doesn't this take away the enforcement mechanism of the bill? Doesn't that take away the teeth of the bill? Why would anyone follow that, follow the law if it were to become law, if there's no enforcement mechanism? Oh, I agree with you. There has to be strong enforcement because we've seen not only on this issue, but on others go to election law integrity issues. Uh, in Wisconsin, for example, there were violations of the state statute when it came to absentee ballots. And the problem was there wasn't an enforcement mechanism against the clerks in two of the biggest counties. So whether it's on election law integrity, whether it's protecting the integrity of women's sports in any of these areas, there absolutely has to be uh, strong enforcement mechanisms. And again, I hope that's in the bill uh, she ultimately signs. And this is the last question on this before we get to the big tech questions. Should Christy Nome sign the bill as it was given to her by the legislature? Well, I would sign it. Uh, if they come back with a modification that doesn't take away from enforcement and keeps the core interest uh, intact, I think that's worth signing as well. But I wouldn't water it down from the ability to enforce it because we know when it comes to particularly government-run school administrators, they're always going to back away from this. It should ultimately be something where those individual athletes have the ability to enforce the law in this, or force the action on the law in the state, not just be left up to some people who have their own political agendas in the schools. And see, Governor, this is the kind of this is the kind of rhetoric we want to hear from politicians and leaders in the conservative movement. You know, not afraid to fight the culture wars, have that fire in your belly that you know that you're not going to back down to corporate interests or wokeism or whatever it is. So I appreciate hearing that from you. And I think it's going to be what separates in years to come the men from the boys and the women from the girls, no gender pun intended here, uh, in the conservative movement. Assuming we can still have men and women, which we do in our world. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So pivoting over to big tech, President Trump also announced that through a spokesman that he would be starting his own social media platform. This comes in the wake of him being banned from Twitter and various other social media platforms. We know that censorship of conservatives happens by these big tech companies, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Instagram, whether it's YouTube, whether it's Twitter. Conservatives have skepticism, and I think rightly so, of allowing government to be involved in these companies because what's worse than, you know, corporatism except government bureaucrats here. What is the solution, though, when these big tech companies have so much power over our lives and are clearly engaging in viewpoint discrimination? Well, they should have done it when they had the chance, and I hope they will again in, in the future when conservatives and Republicans regain control in Washington. And variations of this can be done in the states. But the Section 230 liability exemption, uh, to me, if you're going to go from being a platform where ideas are freely exchanged without editorial uh, enforcement from the publisher or from the uh, entity for, to a publisher, where you do have control of your editorial content, um, if you're going to make that change, if you're going to pick who is on and who's not, then they shouldn't have liability protections. They should repeal Section 230. They had a shot to do that a few years ago. They didn't. They hyped it up but they should have should have done that. In places like Parler uh, and others that come along that just want to be a platform, sure, they should have that protection. But if Twitter, Facebook, anybody else wants to go into the publisher realm, they should have to take the liability risk with that. Of course, they don't want to do that because that would ruin their business model. Uh, but that's where the bottom line hits is you've got you've to take action in those regards. Um, you can't, I don't think, as you're right, you don't want to have a bureaucrat dictating it any more than, you think with talk radio, they tried to invoke the fairness doctrine to get guys like uh, Rush Limbaugh off the air, or at least force a counter to that. We don't want that either. We want the free market deciding those things. But but you shouldn't have special exemptions for liability if they're going to do that. Right. And I think I agree with you, by the way. I think Section 230, it's not ideal to have to repeal it because it had a purpose, but there doesn't seem to be a better solution at this point. The problem here, too, is that, and this speaks to what you're doing at um, at YAF, the problem here is that we've basically 
exported all of these radical leftists who have been indoctrinated on college campuses into our workforce. Yep. So there used to be a saying that said, just wait until these snowflakes get to the real world, then they'll see what's what. None of their nonsense and political correctness will fly at a real job. Well, it turns out that was not correct. It turns out what happened is they brought their wokeness, their political correctness with them from campus. And now this is seeping into our culture via these other institutions, whether it's companies, you know, whether it's private, basically private enterprise, right? So that's where your long game comes in. Mm -hmm. How do we reverse course on college campuses when we've allowed it to get to the point of just an inch from no return? Well, I think you're right. It's very close to that, which is, again, why we have to win the battle and the war for the, the heart and soul of this republic. And so we've, we've got to do a full court press. We've got to be involved in everything. Uh, Young America's Foundation, YAF, is involved with about 2,000 campuses across America where we support conservative students. But there's 4,000. We need to be on every campus. That's a part of our 12-point action plan. We need to have, our goal is to have a million more participants, students involved in our programs. Our goal is to have a YouTube page that has 5 million subscribers and a billion views with people like you and others who've spoke to YA events in, in the past and will be in the future. And in particular, uh, our goal is to take the aggressive efforts we've already been involved in with partners like Alliance Defending Freedom to not just react, but aggressively push for free speech cases all across the country. Because I think the biggest challenge our students in particular have today is they, they feel intimidated. They feel alone. Uh, they're trying to be marge or they're, they're, the left is trying to marginalize them. We need to let young people know that they're not alone. I think not only young people, we need to conservatives in general know that. And then we need to back them up. And that's exactly what our long game plan is about, is giving them the backing and support and the resources. And oh, by the way, we need to start sooner. It's not enough to just wait till somebody gets to college. We need to be in two-year technical and community colleges. We need to be aggressively in high school. We need to be in junior high starting in preteens. And yes, I think we even need to reach out to students and parents, parents of elementary school students, to give them things to counter this really radical indoctrination that in many places, even in the middle of this country, is already starting in the earliest ages in elementary school. Our students need to know that it's okay to love America. It's okay to embrace Judeo-Christian values. It's okay to actually think our founders were pretty remarkable. And oh, by the way, there's a reason why people come from all over the world every single year, millions of them, to legally immigrate into this country. Why? Because America is great and we have such an opportunity to provide freedom and opportunity for every citizen, both those born here and those that legally come here. And I, I think that's, really insightful that you guys are trying to go not just into colleges, but into high schools and middle schools and even elementary schools, because there is garbage that needs to be countered at the lowest levels. I was just tweeting yesterday about what's happening in Nebraska. The Department of Education in Nebraska introduced a new health curriculum that teaches about transgenderism as young as first grade and has third graders defining the gender spectrum. I mean, this is radical leftist gender indoctrination that's being taught to these tiny little kids without front teeth. I mean, these are basically like babies in elementary school getting fed this garbage, they're going to think it's normal. They need an alternative. They need to hear the objective truth, uh, especially if they're forced to go to these public schools where it happens. My last question to you is, it sounds like a harsh question to some of our, you know, fellow Republicans and conservatives. You're willing to speak out on these issues. I'm willing to speak out on these issues. And a few brave others are as well. But in general, especially with our elected officials, why are so many Republicans squishes when it comes to fighting these crucial cultural battles? Well, I, I think a, a lot of them are just afraid. They're afraid that uh, somebody's going to say something that they don't like. Uh, I've learned a long time ago that, that it's better to be respected than loved when it comes to politics and governing. And so I think there's strength in numbers. I still believe the vast majority of Americans share our views and our viewpoints of the world. Uh, I believe we just need to to, to be together. There's strength in numbers. We need to reinforce that. And then we need to show that we expect our elected officials to do the things that they say when they run for office. But think about this whole strategy, Black Lives Matter. It's not about racial issues. It's about three Marxist, self-identified Marxist sympathizers uh, putting together a program to, to do what the Marxists couldn't do generations ago. And that is pit one class of economic citizens versus another, because in America, we live in a classless society. You can start out as poor as can be and end up being the CEO of a major company or successful in any of the right. And so Marxism didn't set in like it did in other places because of that. 
Now they're trying to use race and gender and sex as means of pitting one group of Americans versus another to try and force their Marxist ideological beliefs on the rest of us. We need to point that out. They're the ones being divisive. They're the ones that want to pit one group of Americans versus the other. We're the ones as conservatives that say, we love America. We love our families. And you know what? We want our neighbors' families to do well as well, no matter what they look like or where they've come from, no matter what background they have. We want them to do well in America. And we want those freedoms and opportunities to be available to everyone in this great country. That's a powerful message. And I think the more we spread that, particularly with young people, the more likely we are to make inroads, which is part of our long game. Right. I think you're exactly right. Governor, where can uh, students and benefactors alike go to find out more about the long game? We'll send you a free copy of our 12-point action plan if you go to yaf.org slash long game. We'd love to send you a copy and join us in the battle. There you go. Governor Walker, thank you, sir, so much for being on the show. I appreciate it. My pleasure, Liz. Thanks for having me on.